Hello, I'm Robin Darwell Smith and I'm the Archivist of Jesus College. Here in Oxford, as everywhere else in the world, we are adjusting to strange times as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to spread among us. At times like this, therefore, it is worth reflecting that during the history of a college four and a half centuries old, many previous members of Jesus College have also faced moments of crisis, whether through pandemic or war. In these two podcasts, therefore, I am going to consider how these crises really affected the College and how our predecessors coped. In this first podcast, I am going to talk about the pandemics and wars of our early years up to the 1660s. By the time that Jesus College was founded in 1571, the British Isles were well used to frequent visitations of bubonic plague or other epidemics, such as the mysterious sweating sickness of 1551. Plague, then, was a regular visit to Oxford, as it was elsewhere. So we must remember that, for the first decades of this college's life, its members had ever to be on the alert for news of outbreaks of plague within the city. Even if the true causes of bubonic plague would not be known for many centuries, there were, by 1571, well-known procedures in place for keeping outbreaks localised. As far as Oxford colleges were concerned, the best policy was evacuation. The wealthier ones, like Maudlin or Merton, actually owned properties near Oxford, which were specifically set aside as a place of retreat for their members during such times. Poorer colleges tended to hire accommodation as required. Now, we don't have any good evidence for what people at Jesus College did during these epidemics but it seems probable that its members likewise got out of Oxford at the earliest opportunity. The last really major outbreak of bubonic plague in England was the Great Plague of London of 1665. Thanks to the diaries of the historian Anthony Wood, we know how Oxford reacted. In July 1665, watches were set on entrances to Oxford, as he put it, to keep out infected persons. Thus, anyone coming here from London, whether infected or not, would get short shift. This policy worked. Some months later, Wood noted that we had not the least show of the infection of plague among us. Admittedly, Oxford could not adopt the same hard line when, in September, Charles II, his court and parliament, all moved here from Salisbury as part of their attempts to avoid the plague. Parliament met in Christchurch Hall, while Charles II settled in Christchurch and his Queen in Merton, just like Charles I and Henrietta in the 1640s. And the other courtiers settled where they could, including, presumably, Jesus. Charles and his entourage remained until January 1666, and Anthony Wood was glad to see them go. As far as he was concerned, the courtiers were nothing more than rough, rude whoremongers. But at least they had not brought any plague with them. So when it came to plague, therefore, Jesus College, you might say, dodged that bullet. The same, however, could not be said of our fortunes during the English Civil War. By 1640, Jesus College was in a flourishing condition, a succession of great fundraising principles culminating in Francis Mansell, had found the money to complete the first quadrangle, start work on a second, and secure endowments for several fellowships and scholarships. Numbers of students were holding up. 24 undergraduates matriculated from Jesus in 1638, and between 1639 and 1641, just about a dozen students came up to Jesus College each year. Two years later, though, in the summer of 1642, there was a serious threat of war as hopes of an agreement between Charles I and Parliament disappeared. In September and October, Oxford was occupied, first by some royalist soldiers and then by some parliamentarian ones. And then at the end of October, Charles I himself came to Oxford with his court. The king lived in Christchurch, his queen in Merton, and the courtiers found accommodation where they could in the colleges. 
according to a biography of Francis Mansell, generally attributed to his pupil and eventual successor, Sir Leoline Jenkins, Jesus's visitors included, I quote, the Lord Herbert, since Marquis of Worcester, and other persons of quality that will come out of Wales upon the king's service. According to Jenkins, Principal Mansell was away from college when war broke out, being in Wales, arranging some fresh benefactions for us, all of which unfortunately came to nothing. Travel, of course, was highly dangerous, but in the winter of 1642 he managed to return to Oxford. For the final stages of his journey, though, from Worcester, he was able to travel with the king's army. Mansell came back to a college in a bad way. Most members of the university were able to fled the city, and next to no students chose to take their places. In 1642, just six students matriculated from Jesus College. In 1643, it was one. In 1644, two. In 1645, three. And there were none at all in 1646. The college's finances suffered. Many of our estates were in Wales, and it was just too dangerous to travel out to collect rents from them. Income from students for their admissions or for taking degrees also dried up, and from 1644 to 1648, the college appears to have given up keeping annual accounts altogether. Now, Mansell and the members of Jesus College were hearty royalists, but that support came at a price. In particular, like just about every college, we gave all our plate to be melted down for coin. We therefore have no silver from the early days of our existence. There was another danger. Thanks to the presence of the royal court, Oxford was heavily crowded, and the situation was ripe for disease. In the summer of 1643, there was an epidemic of so-called camp fever, morbus campestris, which in recent times has been identified with typhus, and Jesus's occupants suffered with the rest. One such was Sir Edward Stradling, a royalist officer who had been captured and imprisoned, but released through an exchange of prisoners in May 1644. He travelled to Oxford, where he fell ill of a fever and died on 20th of June. Although not a member of Jesus himself, two of his younger brothers, Edmund and George, had been attached to the college, and perhaps because of this, Sir Edward was buried in our chapel. Meanwhile, Francis Mansell had personal as well as national problems. In September 1643, his brother, Sir Anthony Mansell, was killed at the First Battle of Newbury, and Jenkins speaks of Mansell falling seriously ill from great sorrow. On his recovery, Mansell chose to get back to Glamorgan to settle his brother's affairs and look after his children. Once there, he clearly decided that he could be of more use in Glamorgan than in Oxford, because he remained in South Wales until 1647, doing his best to strengthen royalist opinion there and help refugees escaping areas controlled by Parliament. After the war came a reckoning. In May 1647, the victorious parliamentarians instituted a group of visitors to inspect Oxford and to root out those who might oppose the new regime. When the visitation of Oxford was held in the spring of 1648, Mansell, and all but two of the fellows of Jesus College refused to swear allegiance to Parliament, and so were expelled. A former fellow, Michael Roberts, was appointed as the new principal, and the vacant fellowships were also filled up by the visitors. The Civil War was now over, and had left Jesus in a wretched condition, from which it would take at least a decade to recover. Michael Robb, apparently under some pressure. Perhaps it did not help matters that Mansell himself was permitted to live in rooms above the college entrance, supposedly staying aloof from any intrigue. In 1660, however, on the restoration of Charles II, Mansell was reinstated as principal. By now in his early 70s, 
Mansell was never going to be a very active principal, and indeed his main aim seems to have been to find a suitable successor. Fortunately, one such candidate accepted the post, namely Leoline Jenkins, and in March 1661, Mansell contentedly resigned as principal, living in college until his death in 1665. The college had chosen well. Jenkins would become a great principal and an even greater benefactor. But we should never forget Francis Mansell's devoted service to the college. Such were the national crises faced by Jesus College in its early years. Although the 18th and 19th centuries hardly lacked for drama, yet nothing in them happened which so completely shook the college to its core as did the Civil War. It is not until the 20th century that we encounter anything similar, and it is this which I will discuss in my next podcast.